Welcome to the Femsplainers. I'm Danielle Crittenden. And I'm devoting this episode to really quite a wild and interesting news story from the city of Everett in Washington state. It's raised an important philosophical question about the sexual nature of women's breasts. Maybe it's not just a philosophical question, but a legal one as well. The story began over a decade ago with a coffee stand. Now, a coffee stand is not unusual for the region. Everett lies about 25 miles north of Seattle, which is pretty much the coffee capital of the United States. And Everett's also one of the main cities in the Puget Sound region. But this coffee stand was going to be a lot different from your local Starbucks. Somebody got the idea and can we say the scalding hot idea for the servers to wear bikinis or sometimes even less than bikinis and to offer their customers a greater variety of products as in more than your double espresso or triple skim latte with an extra shot. And it came up with the catchy name of Crab and Go. Not long after the coffee stand opened, it was busted by police and several baristas were charged with prostitution. But this didn't stop the business or the business model from proliferating. Soon there were copycat coffee stands with names like Espresso Gone Wild, Bottoms Up Espresso, Twin Peaks, and Java Jugs. The baristas served up strip shows and other sexual acts. The local police continued to launch sting operations. As one cop said, we have no problem with what they were wearing. It was what they were taking off while they were serving coffee. Finally, the city council was able to pass ordinances that would prohibit baristas from exposing a lot of skin. They banned, and I'm going to quote, exposure or display of one's genitals, anus, bottom, one half of the anal cleft, or any portion of the nipple of the female breast, in addition to other rules for attire aimed at the coffee stand workers. The justification included a line that, quote, the minimalistic nature of the clothing worn by baristas at these bikini stands lends itself to criminal activities. Well, the bikini baristas fought back. They claimed their rights were violated under the 14th Amendment, which requires all citizens to be treated equally under the law. They argued that the city was requiring, quote, all women and not men to cover more than three quarters of their breasts while in public areas. The co-owner of a stand called Hillbilly Espresso said, quote, we firmly believe this is a women's rights issue. The dress code is ridiculous and it's now taking on a life of its own. And to be fair, the shirtless male servers at Dream Boys Espresso, a male copycat stand, were not being hassled by the cops. Well, this case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, which ended up booting it back to the Ninth Circuit Court last year. The city is now waiting for a ruling as to whether it has violated the barista's 14th Amendment rights. The case raises many larger questions about female breasts. Why should they be treated differently from male chess? Is there sexualization a societal construct, a product of the male gaze, therefore a burden unfairly imposed upon women by the dreaded patriarchy? If I feel like mowing my lawn topless, why should I be penalized? Why can't I go to the municipal pool wearing just a pair of shorts? Okay, aside from the fact that I might scare the children. So to address the legal reasoning behind these issues, I'm going to first bring on Ramsey Rammerman, who is the deputy city attorney for the city of Everett. And he's been representing Everett against the baristas. And then for a broader conversation, I'm going to be joined by evolutionary biologist, Heather Hine, who will answer among many questions, are men to blame for the sexual attractiveness of breasts or is it mother nature's fault? Why, unlike the udders or teats of other mammals, did women's breasts evolve to have purposes or virtues, if you will, beyond the purely utilitarian task of feeding babies? And spoiler alert, we're going to answer the age old question of why do men have nipples anyway? But first, I uh, just want to remind you that if you're enjoying the Femsplainers and these conversations, to please consider becoming a 
a subscriber at patreon.com slash femsplainers. Your membership helps keep the podcast going and truly without your support, we couldn't continue. Uh, you can join for as little as $5 a month, appreciate $10 a month. That might be about the price of a cup of coffee at Java Jugs, um, <laughs> but without the services. Uh, but you will get you will get in return for your subscription, you will get a monthly uh, exclusive podcast in which you get to ask our guest questions. And many of you have uh, sent questions to Heather, which we'll be uh, answering at the end of the month in our last call podcast for subscribers. You also get a newsletter and at certain levels, you'll be able to get the podcast ad free um, and early. So please consider joining at patreon.com slash femsplainers uh, we're going to go to a sponsor right now, and then we'll bring on Ramsey. To the Femsplainers. Thank you. You're you're an honorary mansplainer on this absolutely crazy story. Um, so you are now you're now just waiting for a decision from the district court on um, uh, equal treatment under the law. Can you just explain what that means in this instance? Yeah. So in this case, we have um, adopted two ordinances, and one of them is a lewd conduct ordinance that requires men and women to cover different parts of their body, or specifically only requires women to cover portions of their breasts. And so um, they have challenged this law on the equal protection saying that, you know, we're distinguishing between sex in, um, under this law. And so um, we have responded saying that, well, we are distinguishing between men and women. It's based on the biological differences between men and women and is therefore justifiable um, in, this, in this particular circumstance. And um, just tell us a little bit by way of background, what was actually being served at these coffee stands? Because um, it wasn't just like a case of Hooters where women were, in, were scantily clad, you know, pulling espressos. Yeah. So. Um, to understand this, it, it helps to understand or get an idea a little bit of the physical structure that we're talking about. So a drive through coffee stand, if you haven't seen one, it's like a little hut and it's got windows on both sides of it and cars can come up and um, they'll have coffee served to them. Well, here what the, the bikini barista stands, what they've done is they've blacked out one of the windows and then they'll locate the stands in locations where um, nobody can see what they're doing from the backside of the stands. And therefore, it ends up creating a relatively private environment where the person who dry, who's at the window, the one non-blacked out window, um, and the barista have a fairly you know, intimate and private situation. And so what had happened is that one of the people who had purchased one of these stands, um, who was a former stripper, um, took her lessons from strip clubs and applied them to these stands and um, to engage in illegal conduct. So they were, obviously there was plenty of instances of baristas um, flashing, but they would also, uh, many of the baristas would engage in, in uh, physical contact with the customers or allow the customers to have physical contact with them. Um, and so it amounted to uh, straight up prostitution going on at these stands. Um, and so that's what we were dealing with. It was way more than just even just the flashing. It was, uh, they, they were running it effectively. It's almost like a drive through brothel. And, and as I understand, um, going through the legal documents, that some of these uh, servers were 16. I mean, that there were underage servers as well. It, 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 I mean, it, it amounts almost to sexual trafficking in some cases. Yes, we, and we did have one case where um, someone, we, a 16-year-old, there was another instance that, that I saw in the record, one of the other police departments had come across, a 17-year-old. Um, and uh, even women who were over 18 
we had many instances where they didn't know what they were getting into when they started at the stands. <laughs> they thought um, they're just serving coffee. <laughs> yeah. You know, and drugs were very prevalent. And so there's one sad story of one of the baristas who was like, you know, I just kept on getting grabbed by all the customers. It was horrible, but you know, I was high on Adderall all the time. So finally I just kind of went with it. Um, so, you know, not all of them were, were particularly voluntarily doing this. Um, and because they were breaking the law, um, they couldn't go to the police. Um, one of the baristas threatened to go to the police and the stand owner said, well, I've got you on video having, you know, sexual contact with customers. Let's go down to the police department. And of course that didn't end up happening. Um, so yeah, it was, it was way, it was very extreme. And many, uh, many instances, these baristas were being pressured to engage in the more expensive sexual conduct um, by the stand owner and then dealing with the customers who had come to expect a lot more than just their coffee. And so if a barista didn't want to engage in that conduct, she still was going to be having to fend off men all the time. If no prostitution had been involved, would these stands have been shut down? I mean, would they have been allowed to serve coffee in bikinis? Certainly. Um, this was really very much a reaction to um, this repeated conduct. We had four different stand owners who were that we, we learned that were facilitating and encouraging this type of um, illegal prostitution conduct at the stands. And, and it, made, it convinced us that this business model is um, just you know, too easily to abuse. Now, that doesn't mean every stand is operated that way. Um, I'm sure a lot of them aren't. And certainly right now, the plaintiff stand in this lawsuit um, we have reason to believe is not engaging in this conduct, but of course, you know, they're under greater scrutiny with the lawsuit, but, um, but anybody could abuse the process and, and could have abused this business model um, to, you know, promote the type of prostitution conduct. And um, so, yeah. So they, so they were kind of sassy to make this a uh, equal protection case when it was really much more about violating existing laws on the books relating to lewd conduct and prostitution. Um, but it seems like it got a lot of um, progressive feminist backing. Uh, one of the expert testimonies uh, to the district court last October was from a woman named Tommy Ann Roberts, who's a professor in psychology uh, at C Colorado College, but she's been a uh, past president of the Society for Menstrual Cycle Research and served on two specially appointed committees by the American Psychological Association and Presidential Task Force. And so she, so she argued, and I'd just like to hear your um, reaction to this. Um, she said, the lewd conduct ordinance and the dress code ordinance of the city of Everett do not solve the problem of the sexualization of women Instead, they function as a sexist policing of what women ought to wear, guised as measures to keep them safe and to project more wholesome conduct, all while never holding account of those, accountable those people whose gazes or action towards women, no matter what they are or not wearing, are actually doing the harm. So they're sort of arguing, what is the legal justification for treating a female breast differently from a male breast? And as we know, there was um, a male version, well, not quite a male version of this, but uh, a topless male coffee stand that opened Dream Boys, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know what conduct they were engaged in, but I suspect it was probably mostly selling coffee. But so what, what is the legal justification? So the legal justification is based on um, the determination that um, breasts are, um, you know, secondary sex, sexual characteristics um, closely associated with, you know, intimate activity um, like the, you know, the rear end or genitals. And therefore, you know, we have the inherent authority to require people to cover part, those parts of their body up. And obviously only women have breasts. So the laws, well, you know, when it comes to breasts, we simply only require women to cover them up. But it really comes down to the dispute here is whether um, the sexual nature of breasts, breasts have a biological basis or if it's purely a societal construct. 
And um, they're arguing that it's purely societal construct and therefore by um, requiring women to cover, we're just perpetuating this stereotype in the society. And we've responded by saying, no, it, there is actually a biological basis for the sexual nature of the female breast. And therefore we aren't just acting on a stereotype, we're acting on a real physical difference between men and women. And uh, they also, she also went on to say that there's no meaningful difference between the bikinis worn by baristas and the outfits worn by the seagulls, which is, I guess, the cheerleading squad for the football team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so when I deposed um, Professor Robert, she explained by that, she agreed that physically they looked very different because when we're, we say bikini baristas, but we aren't talking about bikinis here. We're talking about, you know, pasties and G-strings or it's one of my uh, police officers colorfully described, colorfully described it. Um, some of these women are only wearing two nickels, a dime and some dental floss. <laughs> um, so, if, you know, these aren't, aren't bikinis um, first off, but it's, um, so that's what they're wearing. And um, I forgot your question now. <laughs> oh, no, but the legal, the, 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 it's just going back to this legal, this idea. Oh, legal, that, oh the, yeah. you were talking about the seagull, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so she, the Professor Roberts admitted that the outfits were um, a lot more revealing than the seagull outfits in the deposition. And what she said she was trying to say by there's no meaningful difference is both outfits are meant to evoke a sexual reaction in men. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of where what she explained what she meant by that characterization because these certainly are way more skimpier than what uh nfl cheerleaders wear now if she i mean so in some ways and this is i don't quite understand so they've tried to take all the prostitution and violation lewd violations out of this case to argue that regardless they should be able to serve coffee in these outfits. And if they were to succeed, if the district court comes back and says, yes, we don't actually see any reason why, you know, these women should be treated different from the dream boys. Uh, what will, what will that mean? Like what will happen? Well, um, first I think it is, it is worth um, noting that, so we have the amendment to the lewd conduct ordinance, which does distinguish between men and women. And then we have our dress code for the stands. And that one doesn't on its face distinguishing between men and women. Their argument is because there are only female bikini baristas, it'll only be enforced against women and therefore, and it was intended to be only enforced against women. So it's motivation behind it because it's violate equal protection. But if the court rules that the um, gender distinction in the lewd conduct ordinance violates equal protection, then um, you know we, the city won't be able to you know, prohibit women from being topless in public. Um, so has, has there been a lot of public support for the bikini ladies? Um, no, uh, we have had, you know, we've had several um, city council hearings and um, in the most recent hearings, the, all the people who testified in favor or against the ordinance, so in favor of the plaintiffs in this case, were all um, associated with bikini barista stands. We had a couple um, individuals um, who were opposed to it most recently. Um, in our 2009 hearing, we had a uh, huge support for our position and against the bikini barista stands. Um, but there hasn't been broad public support for the barista stands. We still get regular complaints about them. Um, and it's so. Uh, and when do you, when do you expect to hear? We are, you know, it's, it's federal court, federal judges have um, you know, incredibly broad discretion on how quickly they rule on things. Normally, we would expect, you know, between three to six months to have a, a motion like this resolved, if not sooner. Um, but there's a lot of discretion. So we will see. Hopefully, in the next couple of months, we'll hear something. All right. Well, this, this is just fascinating, Ramsey. Thank you. I, I hope you'll keep us posted on what happens there. And, and we really appreciate you stopping by to give the legal background on this fascinating case. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Our longtime listeners know that we are a dog-loving podcast. But I must reveal to you that among our co-splainers are cat lovers, indeed even cat owners, 
one of them being Caitlin Flanagan. So she told me she has many names for her cat of 12 years. By the way, dogs don't go by many names, but apparently her cat does. And some of them include Duffy, Little Black Cat, and even Psycho. Uh, But because she's old, she's facing some health issues. So Kayla was very excited to hear about one of our new sponsors, Pretty Litter. Now, like any cat owner, Caitlin is not fond of the stink bombs her cat leaves in her litter box. Everything from cleaning to covering up the smell is a constant battle. Enter Pretty Litter. Pretty Litter is kitty litter reinvented. Unlike traditional litter, Pretty Litter's super light crystals trap odor and release moisture, resulting in dry, low-maintenance litter that doesn't smell. And Pretty Litter is virtually dust-free because it's manufactured with a specialized de-dusting process. Less dust and no fuss. And Pretty Litter arrives safely at your door in a small, lightweight bag that lasts up to a month. And with free monthly auto shipping, you don't have to deal with those last-minute trips to the store. But above all else, here's why Pretty Litter is a pet parent's hero. It's a health indicator. Pretty Litter actually monitors cat's health by changing colors when it detects potential underlying issues. So you won't find that kind of innovation in conventional litter. So if Duffy or Psycho develops an issue, her litter will tell Caitlin. Honestly, if there's no smell, I might have to announce to our Labradors that maybe we'll get a cat tenant. In any case, get the world's smartest litter without leaving home by visiting prettylitter.com and use promo code FEMSPLAIN for 20% off your first order. That's prettylitter.com promo code FEMSPLAIN for 20% off. Okay, I'm now very excited and honored to be joined by Heather Hain. She's the author of Antipode, Seasons with the Extraordinary Wildlife and Culture of Madagascar. She co-hosts with her also evolutionary biologist husband, Brett Weinstein, the Dark Horse podcast. And she's a returning femsplainer for reasons that will become apparent in seconds because truly everything she has to say is just so fascinating and insightful. So let's bring on Heather. Heather, welcome back to the Femsplainers. Thank you so much, Danielle. I'm thrilled to be here. It's it's so great to have you back. And I I, I always love your perspective. I, I love anything from a scientific perspective. And these issues very rarely get a scientific perspective. It always seems to be some sort of political perspective. But um, so we've heard all about the legal aspects of the case. And you're an expert on, I don't want to say breasts, because that would just sound weird. <laughs> It's just a little yes. weird. <laughs> the the evolution of so many things, <laughs> but among them, yeah. you have you have you have you have thought about this. You have studied this, and I, I just want to start by reading you um, some testimony uh, from this expert, uh, T- Tommy Ann Roberts, and uh, we 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 talked about her with Ramsey, but from your perspective, uh, she said in her brief, she said. It's my assessment based on my experience, education, research, and teaching regarding gender and the the objectification of girls and women that the sexualization and objectification of the female breast and body is a societal construct with no scientific basis. Two, female breasts are not genitals, and there's no evidence to suggest that people are harmed by exposure to the female breasts. Three, There is no justification for treating voluntary exposure of the female chest or breast any differently than the male chest or breast. Four, given the lack of evidence linking the exposure of the female breast to any harm, the city's ordinances are unlikely to achieve their stated interest. And last, five, the baristas enjoy and feel empowered wearing bikinis to work and should be permitted to do Mm. so. So what was your perspective on on, uh, on on these points of view? 
there, there are a tremendous number of things there to respond to. Um, maybe if, if you'll allow me, I'll start more than a hundred million years ago. Okay. <laughs> okay. We got, we got time. We, we got, got time. time. I swear I'll go fast. <laughs> um, so, I mean, as everyone knows, right, mammals, the, you know, the, the eponymous trait for which mammals are named is mammary glands, right? So we have the origin of milk and therefore maternal can and obligate maternal care at the origin of mammals. Um, well, more than a hundred million years ago. And at that point, actually, it was just the early and still we have a few of these, the platypus and the echidnas um, just kind of ooze milk. They don't even have nipples. And so some amount of time later, we have nipples evolving. And then, you know, fast forward a tremendous amount of time and you have in primates, um, as uh, litter size gets smaller and smaller, you go from several sets of nipples to only two. And so while most mammals have, you know, as, you've, as you know, if you have pets, if you've ever looked at the stomach of a cat or a dog or, or a cow, you know, um, have two or three or four or five even, I think, um, sets of nipples, as the number of babies that you have at a time gets smaller, the number of nipples shrinks too. And so these are sort of some of the steps in the evolution of breasts-ish, but also just milk production. And so I frame it that way because obviously originally, Breasts are about milk. That's like, that's, that's, that's what it is. And with humans, we get another step. So we've already, um, with all of the apes, I think it is, um, only have two, one set of nipples, two, two nipples, and they only engorge when the mother is actually lactating. And then they go back to being um, pretty nondescript. But sometime after humans split from the lineage that became chimps and bonobos, we got to having what are called persistent breasts. Like we have, we obviously have breasts at all times in our cycle, no matter what, you know, from the moment that we um, enter puberty through, through death, really, it doesn't, it's not even like they shrink after menopause and they certainly don't um, shrink down to nothing when we're not lactating. You know, anyone who's been pregnant or been around a pregnant woman or a lactating woman knows that they um, grow a little bit then. Um, but breasts being persistent and that being different between men and women tells us that there's something going on with regard to um, a, a new stage, a new sexually selected aspect to what breasts are. So breasts are no longer in humans just about feeding children. Right, they also have this sexually selected characteristic, and you know, to Tommy Ann Roberts' point about they're not genitals. Well, that's true, but there's lots of stuff that's not genitals that's sexually selected. Right, um, we have you know also the um, disparate distribution and abundance of body hair on men and women isn't genitals, but it's sexually selected. Right, so um, different distributions of fat in other places like buttocks and just greater amounts of fat um, in on average in women that's also sexually selected. So we have we have breasts that are persistent as a new character in humans, and that tells us something right there about this is this is about um, almost certainly signaling, right? This is about um, signaling and um, attracting, keeping mates, you know, is the original function uh, child nutrition, of course it is. And that remains the fundamental function that hasn't changed, but onto that, and this is, you know, this is one of the wonders of, of evolutionary change. We now have an additional function of breasts and we can, we can see that by the fact that they're, they're different. In, in human females than they are in any of the other uh, mammalian females on the planet. Well, do they, um, what is, would there be evolutionary strategy in terms of larger breasts? I mean, you, uh, an attraction, like what would be the purpose for, uh, as you say, signaling? Why, why are they important for signaling? Uh, that, I don't know. Um, and the, you know, what we, what we see is across cultures, uh, men, you know, and it varies, it varies between cultures um, and to some degree within cultures, you know, you have this sort of this trope in American culture uh, that probably men aren't even allowed to even get close to saying anymore, but like, I'm a leg man, I'm a breast man, right? This used to be a thing that people said. <laughs> I think you can only apply that now to chicken. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, right? Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a wing man. I, you know, <laughs> it falls apart if you go too far down that. Um, but you know, different within a culture, 
um, people are going to be attracted to different aspects of other other human beings, including their bodies. And um, between cultures, there are going to be there that's going to be different too. And in fact, there is some, not a ton, um, but some ethnographic work looking at just you know self reports on you know what is it specifically you know basically anthropologists went and stuck microphones in men's men's faces and said you know what exactly type of breast do you like right and um it does vary you know size is not universally the thing that men's you know men don't universally say i really like big breasts or i really like small breasts um but one of the things that men do say pretty much universally is um with different language but um it's indicators of of youth it's it's tautness it's um it's perkiness Right, like these are the things that um, that men across cultures will say if you ask them directly. And you know, mostly these aren't guys who are walking around expounding on what they like about women's breasts. But you know, if, if asked directly by an anthropologist who's managed to gain their confidence, um, they will they will give similar sorts of answers that that suggests that um, that like for you know everything else. The indicators of youth with regard to female beauty are um, are the things that uh, men universally uh, find attractive. Would that have also that evolutionary purpose of looking for? I mean, we have all these reasons about why certain things about men attract women, and and looking for the good provider, looking for the the good father potentially. Um, is this like a fertility thing that going for the youthful yeah. endowed woman is just part of their evolutionary brain. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I, th there is still a lot of discussion in the evolutionary literature about what our history is with regard to our mating system. You know, do we tend towards monogamy or polygyny specifically? You know, do we, are, are we more likely, are we more adapted to with regard to our anatomy and physiology and behavior and sociality and brains, um, a pair bonded existence or one in which, um, in which men tend to have multiple mates and that leaves a lot of men unmated entirely. Um, and I personally, I find the evidence, we don't have the time for this now, but I'd, I'd be happy to talk with you about this at another time. I find the evidence for um, a, a pretty monogamous past and monogamy being better for almost all the individuals in a population pretty strong. Um, you know, the only, the only people that polygyny tends to serve are the, are the few men who end up attracting, you know, a lot of resources and a lot of women. Um, but are, you know, what, how, therefore, if, if we are fairly monogamous, then there's going to be choice going in both directions. It's not going to be like a peacock where females are sitting back going, well, I can be brown and drab, but I'm choosing, I'm choosing from among the most colorful and, you know, depending on, you know, if it's a different bird, you know, the, the most beautiful song, the most, you know, and, and in other species, uh, the best provider. In fact, you know, the, the guy who seems like he's going to build the best nest or provide the most food for my young, all of these things tend to be female choice in species that are um, pretty asymmetrical with regard to mating system, that is, that tend to have polygyny. But once we're into monogamy, then you get choice going both directions, right? So yeah, females are choosing males, for sure. Women choose men, and we've got all sorts of opinions about what kinds of men we want, but men also choose women in a way that you don't see nearly as much among many other mammals. Like Monogamy is pretty rare in mammals, and so you don't tend to have male choice of females very much in other species of mammals, but um, certainly we do in in humans in every in every culture there is well this um I, I can't believe i finally have someone i can ask this of i think it's like one of nature's great mysteries because of course part of this case is the argument that men's chests aren't sexy in the same way and and actually uh this is what tommy ann roberts said um men are able to walk around topless because their breasts are not sexualized the apparent difference in the way the American culture views male breasts has less to do with their capacity to feed children and more to do with a sexualized perspective, which is, of course, what I just said. But so then why do men have nipples? Like, why are men's chests not sexy? And why do men have nipples? Well, so $100 million dollar question. <laughs> So it's two, it's, a, it's $200 million questions, right? <laughs> um, you know, why men's chests are sexy. You know, but my, I, I don't, I don't know that I've ever talked to a woman who said, yeah, I'm, I'm not interested. I, I have no, I have no interest in, in right. looking at a man's chest ever. Um, but it's not, it's not a secondary sex characteristic the same way that the persistently enlarged breasts of women are. 
right? It's it's just not. So the you know the musculature of a man's chest or his arms or you know wh- whatever it is that you pr- are particularly attracted to are uh, yes, absolutely attractive, but um, but it is not it is not a distinct secondary sex characteristic in humans the way that the persistent breasts are. And then um, there's a number of things to say about you know why why men have nipples, but um, Probably, probably the simplest explanation, without being totally complete, is uh, we're all like sex. Sex is real, and sex and genetic sex determination species like we have is immutable. It doesn't change. Like if you're female, you're female, and if you're male, you're male. Um, but you had almost, you know, you had just as much. Your egg could have received an X sperm or a Y sperm just as much. And so each of us had just as much of a chance of being male or female as, mm-hmm. as whatever we are. And we have um, just as much chance of producing males and females as, as um, you know, males as females and females as males. Um, and so basically a female born without nipples is going to be unable to feed her child. And so given that we basically have a, have a bow plan um, onto which sexual differences are sort of mapped. The bow plan of, you know what, nipples is fundamental, uh, but uh, enlarged breasts is a female thing, is likely to result in fewer errors because you have some men born without nipples, it doesn't really matter except from an aesthetic position, but you have women born without nipples and they're not gonna be able to feed their children. So you mean it's like, we begin in the womb sort of, we could go either way, I think. And then, and the, and that the sort of template for male or female has nipples. And if you actually then are female, they develop as breasts where they don't if you're a male, is that? It's not that it could go either way because we do have genetic sex determination, which means that whatever sperm uh, fertilizes the egg, if it's got an X at that 23rd chromosome position, or if it's got a Y at that 23rd chromosome position, that determines right then and there that the, that the zygote is either going to be a female uh, in the former case or a, a male in the latter case. But um, I think it's more, to my thinking, it's more about the risk of developmental error and um, the fact of being male or female is at once fundamental and also um, sort of circumstantial to a lot of what we do. Like I'm sure that for instance, liver function is somewhat different between men and women, but at base you need to have a functional liver and the particulars are sort of, are, are true and will make a difference in terms of, of medicine and such. And we know this for instance, from you know, heart disease that men and women present differently with regard to um, heart attacks. But how does the heart work? You know, what, what is its function at its core? That is an unsexed proposition. And so I would say just like having two arms is an unsexed proposition, even though female arms and male arms tend to look different, um, the, the chest before the add-on of the breasts is sort of an unsexed proposition because uh, if, you, if, you are a fe- if you are a female, and there's anything in the developmental program that says, ah, sometimes add nipples, sometimes don't, you know, only add nipples when female, <laughs> then errors will result in some, you know, some, some very bad situations. So um, I think to my mind, it's kind of a conservative, it's a conservative evolutionary answer to the risk of being born a female without nipples. Okay, we're just gonna slap them on everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I just wanna stress, I was thinking, just a minute or two ago where you're talking about male breasts. Um, we certainly know that man boobs aren't sexy. So like the, the, yeah. the male chest <laughs> is sexy, but when it presents as female, it's, it's much less, less sexy. Exactly. Right. So the, the male chest is sexy, but when it's, when we're looking at muscle, yeah. right. And yeah. we're not looking at muscle when we're looking at female breasts, right. where, you know, there's, there's some muscle there, but mostly it's not muscle, mostly it's fat. Right. And so when we're looking at that, exactly, as you say, you know, when we're looking at something that is kind of edging in towards what female breasts would look like on a man, most women don't find that attractive. One of the points that is raised is this kind of feminist paradox where uh, they insist that, you know, breasts, are yes yeah, the, se- the the male gaze they are sexualized because the male gaze is imposed upon them, um, but it's uh, but on the other hand um, they're sorry. Trying this is it's t- you know what like I, I 
I every time I talk about this, I end up tying myself in knots. So no, no, okay. So, no. Sorry. So let me let me um okay. Let me let me uh let me I, I, actually let me just uh okay. Let me let me read something else because this 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 creates there is a feminist paradox that is created by both denying that um, the breasts have any sexual attributes at all, you know, that aren't imposed upon them by males, but then also um, women should be allowed to celebrate their sexiness if they feel they're sexualized, but there should also be no repercussions if a woman dress in a very provocative and sexy manner, that that's her right, and that shouldn't automatically, you know, make a male assume that she is easy or loose or slutty, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it. And, and I'm reading again uh, from this brief. She said, preventing baristas from wearing bikinis in order to pre prevent others from sexualizing them is akin to preventing wealthy people from wearing fancy expensive watches in order to prevent others from stealing them. In other words, the claim that sexualization of women produces, quote, permission giving beliefs that allow men to think that negative treatment of women is acceptable renders invisible who is doing the sexualizing. It's not only causally illogical, it is a textbook example of victim blaming. Um, how do you react to that? I mean, I, I mean, you wanna say, of course, a woman who wears a short skirt and no top or a bikini top, you know, you're, you're not asking to, uh, to be attacked, you're not asking for untoward remarks, but you are signaling something that somebody who is uh, educated in evolution would recognize. Yeah, no, I, th I think you, you landed on exactly the word that, that I was going to use. Um, you are sending a signal. You are not inviting. And um, certainly, you know, I think we will all draw lines in the sand somewhere, somewhere differently. Um, for me, one of the ones that I think is very clear is um, no touch ever, no matter what, no, you know, no matter how much you think she is indicating to you that she wants, um, you don't get to touch unless there's been an invitation. Um, but, you know, a woman walking down the street um, wearing very little clothing is sending a signal. And that is, as I, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm sure we could go around forever and ever on this, like not an invitation, you know, there is no excuse for attack. We are not justifying in any way male behavior that comes her way that goes against her wishes. All of these things are true. Um, but just as breasts themselves are signals, evolutionary signals that have been around for um I don't know, probably at least 200,000 years is, is how long we know we've been fully modern and maybe anatomically and physiologically modern and probably longer than that. Um, so too are other choices that you make about the signals um, that you send into the world by what you reveal about yourself. Everything from, you know, the jewelry you wear to the tenor of your voice uh, to the, you know, the book that you're carrying, you know, spine in or spine out. You know, th these are all signals. We know this. We are, we are social beings who are busy signaling to one another all the time. And it gets fraught when we're talking about men and women because men and women um, don't have, are not identical and we don't have identical goals all the time. And, you know, men will compete with men in one way and women will compete with women in another way. And we've got this modern environment in which we're all thrown into it together. And that's wonderful. And, you know, that's, that's the future that I grew up in the seventies and eighties seeing happening in front of me, but it also has created a lot of problems with regard to communication. And I think one of the problems is um, that, we are pretending, we are pretending that we don't have, um, we don't have some of these problems. And the idea that breasts aren't a signal is wrong and not supported by the scientific literature. And the idea, I mean, I, you talked to, you talked to Rams, you talked about this, this case, the idea that those um, baristas were being empowered um, by being expected <laughs> to dress like this and do the kinds of things they were doing, that is as clearly an anti-feminist position as I have heard. You know, the, those young women were not being empowered. That's not to say that these weren't the only jobs that they had available to them, but that's a problem that's much more, much bigger. And it's, you know, it's, it's a class problem and it's a society problem and it's a jobs problem um, that has nothing to do with, oh, if I want to take off my top and serve coffee, I should be allowed to. Um, frankly, that strikes me as um, 
you know, this sort of this what I think of as a quasi liberal feminist position that has just snuck completely over into like a full throated capital L libertarian position that says, you know, no choices at all um, should ever be off limits for me because I get to do what I want. Um, downstream consequences be damned. And there are downstream consequences. Of course there are. Right. And actually what you're saying is um, that the watch analogy does work because the expensive watch signals something. It signals I am wealthy, but it doesn't signal that it should be stolen, just as wearing something provocative signals I am sexy, and but that doesn't mean you can touch me, as you say. So the analogy doesn't quite work. I have one last question. No, is that's, that that's great. Real- uh, let me just say that that's, that's excellent. I, I had read that, um, that expert testimony and it hadn't occurred to me that the analogy it's exactly what you just said the analogy does work yeah. but not in the way that she thinks it does right yeah. right so the last one this is maybe a little more philosophical but i would love your take on it so they're arguing you know obviously if you have to cover your breasts um because men apparently find it too sexual to look at you if you're showing your breasts couldn't that lead us down a sip, slippery slope to the burqa You know, that women in societies that wear burqas, they're dressed this way because men can, you know, are are going to be driven crazy by even just seeing an ankle and it's extreme modesty. Um, And so these same people would say, well, you know, making women not be allowed to expose their chest like men is 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 of the same philosophy. Um, Yeah, Um, I think those those are the those are two excellent examples of extremes that we ought not inhabit. Mm -hmm. And I think there is some value in understanding both. The idea that um, holding me, a woman, accountable for what is in the mind of a man um, is not fair to my personhood, um, which is what perhaps a caricature, I hope not, of what um, Tommy Ann Roberts might might say. Um, And at the other end, um, you know, in cultures where uh, women are forced to wear burqas and aren't allowed outside of the house without a male, male consort, um, the the logic there, I think, and I, I can do a, this will be a character because I'm just not as familiar with it, um, but will be, we are actually protecting our women. You know, the, the logic that sounds like it's um, about um, helping women is that we are actually protecting our women and allowing them to live more full lives without having to worry about um, you know, the, the, the male gaze. And I'm, I'm sure male gaze is not the term that's used over in that space. But um, you know, we, we can, and I think really we must in 21st century, often liberal, often secular, uh, weird society, you know, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic society, um, thread a middle ground. Like we, it's incumbent upon us to do so. And encouraging, um, you know, spring break and girls gone wild is frankly just as regressive in a lot of ways as encouraging burkas. And that doesn't mean that it can be everyone has a choice to do exactly everything they want at all times, because especially in a global society with however many billions of people we have now, um, there are going to be limits as to what we can all do. And I don't, I don't have the answer to what those limits um, have to be, but you know, we, we do need to live with one another and we do live in a society in which we have um, obligations to one another. This is just so, so interesting. I just, cherish having you on. You are so, so, such great explanations and background. Um, thank you. Uh, and, and we look forward, you have a book coming out this fall, you mentioned. So let's give a pre-plug to that you're, you're co-writing with, with Brett. Uh, we have A Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century coming out on September 14th, 2021. It's a book we've been talking about writing for over a decade, and it's finally come to fruition. We're very excited about it. It, uh, it basically points an evolutionary lens at modernity. Um, one, of, one of the chapters is, in fact, on sex and gender, another one on relationship and parenthood, but we tackle food and sleep and medicine and adulthood and um, all sorts of um, modern problems that people are facing. In part, um, our thesis is as a result of the hyper novel conditions in which we live. Wow. 
Okay. Well, we'll definitely beg you to come back on when that book is out, if not before. All right. Thank you so, so much, Heather. You take thank care. Thank you, Danielle. Well, that wraps up this episode on, on breasts and more. I hope you've enjoyed it and we'll see you next time. The Femsplainers is a weekly podcast carried on the Ricochet Network and available pretty much on every podcast platform. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and watch video of our interviews on YouTube. You'll find links to everything, plus how to contact us directly at femsplainers.com. We survive and depend on your support. Like the show? Consider donating as little as $1 a month at patreon.com slash femsplainers and get our exclusive monthly bonus episode, Last Call, in which you get to join the conversation with our guests. And there's much more. And a big shout out of thanks to our audio and video editor, Nat Frum.